beauty of simplicity that brings me down to my knees. I praise you for eternity, Lord. I love you because you, you first loved. beauty of simplicity that fills me with eternity I've tasted your divinity and Lord I love you because you you first loved me and all God's people say we we love Holy 
our hearts and our voices to you. We open ourselves up to your word this morning. We pray that you'll speak to us clearly. You'll fill us up with your spirit. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. Hello there. My name is Pip. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is really nice to see your guy, the upper third of your faces, uh, to see your, your sparkling eyes this morning. Uh, Really happy to have you, and uh, to the, I feel like a TV host whenever I say this, but to those listening from home, we're happy to have you listening in, watching in. Uh, so today the, is the first time we're actually going to be having our third Sunday gathering, so that means that not only will we be having a 9 a.m., not only will we be having a 10.30 a.m., but we'll also be having a noon service. Uh, so that's a service at high noon. So to sign up, we send out an email every, every Sunday, which contains a sermon itself in it, and a sign-up for the next Sunday's gathering. So if you don't receive those emails, just head to the website, and you can sign up for the newsletter there, and you'll receive those emails. But also, you can generally check uh, the website later in the day, Sunday, and you'll see a, a link on the rotator there so that you can sign up for the next Sunday gathering. So that's doorofhopepdx.org. Speaking of doorofhopepdx.org, there's several women's discipleship and activities groups which have started up. There's like a walking group, a hiking group, uh, kind of a variety of different things going on, Bible studies. Uh, they may be socially distant, but they're not emotionally distant or spiritually distant. Uh, so if you're interested in those, just head to doorofhopepdx.org again. And lastly, just a kind of, uh, I was about to say house rules, but that seems a little, I don't really feel, it seems a little weird to say, but just a heads up for today, what we'll, what we'll be doing. So we're keeping masks on, uh, ex except obviously the folks up on the stage as they're talking and singing, or, and my mustache needs to kind of run free a little bit. So masks on, uh, keeping, keeping distance. Uh, the bathroom is, if you just head out right to the back to the rotunda, go left. That's the only restroom that's available right now. Uh, the downstairs restrooms are closed. 
There's a giving box right back there. Uh, uh, as well, there's a nursing mom's room right back there as well. And if, say, you have a kid and they start throwing Legos and screaming, which has not happened yet, but I would honestly, I kind of want to see. But if that were to ha happen or just kind of things are getting a little rambunctious, you can head downstairs. You'll just head out through the door here and Chelsea will direct you. And we actually have a live feed of, of this, of what's going on upstairs, downstairs. So you can hang out there if that's helpful. Lastly, we wish we could have communion. We have, aren't there yet in terms of providing communion, but we are hoping to sometime in the near future. At the end of the service, though, we will have prayer. So if right at the end of the service, if you need prayer, there'll be some folks up here at the front. You can come up there. But for all the rest of you, you can head out that door right there, uh, and Josh will be outside so you can see his smiling face. If you have any questions or just want to keep track of upcoming events, you can just head to the website, doorofhopepdx.org. And actually, if you want to reach out to any of the staff, too, you can just click About there and Staff, and our emails are listed there. We would love to hear from you. And again, we're really glad to see all of you. And with that, I will invite up Mr. Josh White. I feel like there should be some applause while he's walking up here or, or hooting, or I should be getting narrating it. <laughs> Thanks, Pip. Oh, it's good to see all of you. You know, today, uh, I jetted out of the house to get over here and uh, I was I'm like, I'm hungry, I need to eat something. And I'm like, I'm gonna go to the coffee shop next to my house and I, and I was driving down the street and I'm like, dang it, I forgot my mask. And I'm like, what an inconvenience. And then I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go where I can not wear a mask, which was the McDonald's drive-through. And, and I just wanna confess without shame that I ate an English McMuffin, and it was better than anything I got from the fancy coffee shop <laughs> that I've been eating at every day. And then I, I, then I asked the question, what is it about Portland that makes you feel guilty about McDonald's? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even arguing whether it's healthy or not, but why do we feel shame, deep-rooted shame? <laughs> it's like when Darcy and I first got here, literally on Belmont, they had the Stumptown Annex, and we had just moved from California, where the only coffee you could get down there was Starbucks. And we asked the person at Stumptown if they had a dark roast like what we get at Starbucks. And the disdain that came from that barista, <laughs> uh, that was pretty funny. And then we asked for cream, which got further disdain. Uh, so, well, it is great to see all of you. We are going to jump into a new series um, today. And this series really, is coming out of just a multitude of conversations that I've had with, uh, with many from this community, other pastors, questions that are coming up in the church as a whole of how do we navigate these crazy days that we are in. Uh, I mean, it, the last six and a half months have just been one thing after another that has really turned uh, life as we know it upside down on its head. And it has really caused a lot of distress uh, for believers. Um, and I, I think what's a little bit surprising to me about the amount of distress or confusion uh, is it, it shows me that there is a disconnect between what we say we believe as followers of Jesus and what we ascribe to in, in believing that the word of God is exactly that. And, and, but how we actually live that out or, ex, or experience it in our daily lives. And we have lived in an age of great ease by which spiritual mediocrity is allowable. Uh, and, and we don't realize that how much of our um, enjoyment of life is not derived from the source of life, Jesus himself, but how much the enjoyment of our life is derived from the things that our society provides for us. And now those things have been, many of those things have been taken away. And Christians are like left acting as confused as those that don't have any faith. And I think that this is something that's troubling, that it's something that we need to address. Uh, and what I've noticed in conversations is that, is that people are really struggling on how to maintain any kind of vitality in their spiritual life during this time. I mean, if anything, this, is, this has shown us the truth of the first thing that we are told about humanity 
in the Bible itself, and that is, it is not good that man should be alone. The mixture of our lives, the fact that even as born-again believers, we still are wrestling with this thing called sin, sin that comes from within, but then the collective sin that comes from without shapes our existence in a way that we need one another. We need Jesus, we need the Holy Spirit, and we need our community to actually push through difficult days. But I wanna just state that Jesus himself said, in this world, you will have difficulty. But don't be alarmed by that. Don't be worn out by that. For I have already overcome the world. That we live in an apocalyptic age. That is that we are ever since Christ ascended to the right hand of the Father awaiting his return. The church has always been meant to live with an apocalyptic worldview. That is that the best is yet to come and that the world will grow increasingly dark and it will reach a pinnacle before Christ's return. And this raises all sorts of questions then around what is it that we ought to be doing in this time, in this apocalyptic age in which we are living? And how do we live as the witness that God has called us to live? Now, I have seen in 11 years of pastoring Door of Hope, people come to faith with great excitement and enthusiasm only to find that the ways of the world and the multitude of voices and, and various reasons where people become not long after their initial conversion become incredibly disenchanted by their faith, often walking away from the church and sometimes even into sadder places, walking away from their faith altogether. And I think that it, it speaks to a statement that G.K. Chesterton famously made when he said that Christianity is not tried and found wanting, it is found difficult and not tried. And I think it comes to and it, uh, this, this issue that we have in the church today of cheap grace. Now, grace is never cheap, but it is always free. <laughs> so I, I wanna be clear that Door of Hope is about radical free grace. But cheap grace is something else. It's an easy beliefism that has so permeated our ideas about Christianity that many professing Christians walk away from their faith frustrated and disillusioned by their lack of progress. And there is the rub. How do we reconcile grace, God's one-way love toward us in our brokenness, in our sin, and Christian progress toward maturity? without moving back from this recognition, I can't save myself, I can't do anything but say yes to the yes that God has already proclaimed over me in Jesus and the call to move towards sanctification. How do these things reconcile? And, and I think that this is, this is something that continues to be a challenge because I've seen the danger of what I like to refer to as a ladder theology that often is found within the church. A reaction against cheap grace is then moving the church toward a new kind of legalism, the very legalism that supposedly the gospel has saved us from, is that we're not trying to earn God's favor by the things that we do, but out of the fact that we have been the objects of God's affection, even while we were dead in our sin, should create in us a new devotion that leads to increasing degrees of intimacy. But we instead turn the church into a place where we give our people a whole new set of rules to follow, creating that very exhaustion where people end up abandoning the church because it actually was more strenuous and in even more more misery inducing than the way of the world was before they found Jesus or Jesus found them. And so we have to come to a right understanding. And what I want to spend this next series kind of digging into is how do we discipline ourselves toward God godliness? How do we enter into the spiritual disciplines without it being a ladder? How do we anchor our devotion to Jesus in the cross? And the cross is the symbol by which we must continually return to. It's not something we climb, it's something we die on again and again and again. Paul does not say we work for our salvation, he says that we are to work out our salvation. 
And this is where I want us to begin to experience as believers, because we are living in a time where I believe the church is going through a great purging or refinement, if you will. I'm finding my own life being purged in this time. And I think it can be a beautiful thing, a beautiful time of real transformation and real growth if we allow the voice of Christ to be the dominant voice rather than the voices of this age. I want us to move from despair, from despair to hope and from, from unrest to shalom or peace or wholeness. Isaiah 26, three says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he or she trusts in you. And what that means is that we need to learn how to discipline our center. So the series is gonna be called The Disciplines of Grace because all of the practices that the church is, the church is engaged in from its foundation the primary purpose of those practices were not to lead us into a new kind of law keeping, but they were meant to be the outworking of God's radical love toward us in Jesus that would discipline our devotion, that would increase our intimacy. And so that's why I wanna to begin today with that simple question of how then shall we live? If we have been saved by faith through grace, this is not of works, then how are we to progress? Because we're not just to stand still, we're not to just continue living like the world. What does Paul say in Romans? Should we sin that grace may abound? Absolutely not. No, what we need is to have a right center. And I believe that there is two verses that give us the very center, the groundwork from which spiritual disciplines can flow. And it's in Romans 12, verses one and two. Paul writes these words, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. It's a very important verse, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transform, metamorphosis, be changed by the renewal of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Dostoevsky, in his masterpiece, the Brothers Karamazov, wrote these words, for the secret of man's being is not only to live, but to live for something definite. And the most definite thing that one can live for is the very one who created the universe, who spoke into existence all that is, the one who created you for himself, and that is the will of God. We live for all sorts of things that are passing, and that is why the age of corona, <laughs> or COVID, is the age in which the things that we have been living for are being revealed for what they are, passing, fleeting. And what we need is to come back to a center and to understand what the will of God actually is. Now, the problem is, is that for many, the will of God is almost always conceived of as a program that we are to discover. Who should I marry? Where should I live? What should I do? It is often the emphasis upon guidance by treating God like a magic eight ball. An example of that is that Door of Hope, you know, has always historically had a lot of young adults. And young adults, I always say that there is no revival in history that isn't ushered in by the zeal of young people. But the zeal of young people, spiritual zeal, can sometimes be misdirected because when we're young, we do unfortunately fall into the trappings of believing. We haven't lived long enough to know that our life is going by really fast. And that, that zeal is a beautiful thing. I think it's an absolutely necessary thing. It's the, it's the place of vitality. And believe me, I am feeling that need for youthful vitality at the end of three months of seven days a week of a, the most intense remodel ever. My body is telling me every day right now that I am not in my 20s any longer. Uh, but that zeal can often be misguided, especially when it's spiritualized. And I have had, <laughs> I've had more than once someone come up to me and say, God told me I'm supposed to marry this person. 
Like, whoa, really? That's crazy. Like, how did he tell you? I just felt it in my spirit. I'm like, I, I remember specifically with one young man, I said, did the Lord speak the same word to the woman that you're going to marry? And he goes, I haven't asked her out yet. And I'm like, well, before we decide what the will of God is, let's just begin with a little simple, practical, non-spiritual step of asking her out. Well, he did, and she didn't even go on a date. So if we spiritualize things and come to the idea that the will of God is God telling me to do something, rather than actually me aligning myself with what God is doing, uh, then you're left with two options on that. Either God isn't telling you the truth, uh, or God isn't actually there at all. And both of those are deeply problematic answers. And the, the fact is, is that James himself says, you, 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 you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you're asking for the wrong reasons and the wrong things. And so what you come up against is the silence of God. But God is not silent. He is continuously speaking into his creation. The key, and I think the key to all spiritual disciplines is to attune our lives to that voice, that center, to begin to actually align ourselves with our king. The will of God is less of a program and much more significantly a relationship not that it has nothing to do with guidance, it does, but his guidance comes out of a vibrant relationship with him and his primary concern is your relationship with him that he might bring his relationship with the world to the world through you. <laughs> so what we're gonna consider is this center because what we need is to understand what our calling is Calling is connected to this relationship. Os Guinness said that calling is the truth that God calls us to himself. So that dis decisively, everything we are, everything we do, and everything we have is invested with a special devotion, dynamism, and direction lived out as a summons, as a response to his summons and service. And I think that this is key for us. This is what should inspire our disciplining of ourselves is that we have been loved. And that love is revealed through Jesus and his laying down his life for us and his resurrection and ascension in the sending of his spirit. And as the love of God is poured out in our hearts, it should transform our affections where the things that we are most passionate about is our alignment with our King and being a witness of that king to the world around us. We begin to see the world with his eyes. We begin to live with a new lens where we don't hit this place of despair at what is going on. It's not that we won't be troubled, it's just that we're able to take that trouble to the one who can help us channel that back toward a productivity that flows out of a yieldedness to his spirit. Discovering the will of God begins with this. Number one, sacrifice. Look what it says in verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, notice that, based upon all that I have said up to chapter 12 in Romans, which, what is Romans? The most theologically robust explanation of the gospel found in the Bible based upon the inner workings of the gospel that you have been saved by faith through grace, this is not of works, that it is all about what God has already accomplished for you through his son Jesus Christ on your behalf, that Jesus is the true representative man. He is the newborn over a new humanity and that we have this Holy Spirit who comes in and pours the love of God out in our hearts so that we can be more than conquerors in this world. Paul lays out the entire gospel and he says, in light of the gospel of grace, of God's mercy, as I have just spoken to you of, I want you now practically to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is holy. This is what it means to be holy. 
Not that you become perfect, but that you become surrendered to the one who is. And pleasing, it brings God joy when his children allow him to be responsible for them. And it actually is the very thing that defines what worship, true worship is. And so here we see the beginnings, the sense of mission for us as followers of Jesus always begins with submission. Mission flows out of submission. Do we understand that? See, this is why I have always put the emphasis when we talk about sin and the very reality of sin and the very collective, the increasingly, as Jacques Ellul beautifully points out, that in a technological age in which he was already prophetically seeing in the 40s what was coming through the age of the internet and social media and all these things, that sin is no longer just an interior problem for believers, that it is an increasingly collective problem for the world as we become more and more globalized, that there are a million voices that we are inundated with every day sending us message upon message of propaganda, misinformation. The only facts that we are given today through the media is essentially partial truths and a lot of fabrication and agenda. And this is why we need to center ourselves in the one who is the truth. Because we live in an age in which truth has been replaced with relativism, where whatever is good for me is good for me. Just don't tell me what it is that I should believe. But that's the problem is that those who preach the message of tolerance in this age are intolerant of anyone that would disagree with their definition of that very thing. And in this intense, increasingly volatile environment in which there are, what I would say, a call to revolution without an actual cause, <laughs> Uh, we need to understand that we need more than ever to surrender ourselves to the right voices. This is why we need to discipline ourselves toward godliness. Because disciplining ourselves toward any kind of engagement in anything in society right now without Jesus as the center is going to be misguided. The will of God, first and foremost, is that you become God's property. And sin by its very nature is what? I will be my own God. I will define for myself what is right and what is wrong. And this is what we see being played out in every arena of human existence right now, especially in the West. And this is why if we want to discipline ourselves toward godliness, our prayer life, our study, our reading, our service, all of those things, if they aren't anchored first and foremost in the lordship of Jesus over every arena of our lives, then it will not only exhaust us, but it will often misguide us. So we begin with a new devotion, surrender to this king it is sacrifice and sacrifice is the key to worship the first time worship is mentioned in scripture is when Abraham goes to sacrifice his son it is laying down even that which is dearest to us at the hands in, 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 into the hands of Jesus and we say Lord I am yours everything I have is yours I trust you with my life and nothing requires discipline like that act and it's not a one-time act when you get saved it's a daily moment by moment act of surrender it's what Jesus means by drinking from the wealth in which you will never be thirsty again he's not saying you take one drink he's saying there is a well that never dries up but you have to perpetually drink from it Surrender is not a one-time thing. I die once and then I just live in the power of a resurrection life. No, the resurrection life flows out of a continuation of what I like to refer to as good deaths. That we die to the lies of who God never intended us to be, that we might come alive into the fullness of who he is. His desire is intimacy with us and a voluntary submission to his desire to inhabit us, body and soul, so that our redeemed humanity may be an expression of his life. And that is what the world needs to see right now more than ever. 
Isn't that what Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 says? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love can know God's will, can be an expression of God's love. In Alul's beautiful book, The Presence of the Modern World, he argues that the church's primary call is to be a, a sign that points to the kingdom of God. And he uses three metaphors that Jesus himself uses of the church that, that speak of the central importance and purpose of what the church is to be about. And it is to be a witness. And he uses the, the, the sign of light, salt, and sheep amongst wolves. And look, listen to what he says among the meta, about the metaphor of sheep amongst wolves. I, I have it on the slide behind me. In the world, everyone seeks to be a wolf. No one is assigned to play the sheep's role. Yet the world cannot survive if no one bears living witness to the sacrifice. This is why it is essential for Christians to guard against being wolves spiritually. That is spiritual dominators. Christians must accept others' domination over them and daily sacrifice their lives, reflecting in this way the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Think about the amount of domination happening in the realm of social media, when you see a battle happen, whether it's on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, where people just start like, you know why, why it never actually leads to any sort of actual critical engagement or even, even argumentation? You can't argue with people that have their own set of facts. You can't argue with people that have no truth basis uh, and so if it's just a series of opinions that are combative, that is problematic. And that is why I would argue that the, the solution for the world's dilemmas is not going to be found politically or even socially. It's going to be found supernaturally because the essence of the world's problems right now are primarily spiritual. I don't care if we're talking about politics or race or, or economics poverty, all of those things, whether we're talking about homelessness, the issues at the root of all of these problems are primarily spiritual. They come down to a sin nature. And we are often as Christians more comfortable listening to fallen minds, teaching fallen minds, than we are coming to the divine mind who actually does love all humanity because it's his creation who he created in his image. And he wants us to be a people that bring dignity to all people. But he wants us to, be a, to do that by being a witness to his son, Jesus. We are to be conduits of his love. That is why I say first and foremost, the church is to be about witness. It's not that we aren't to be about engagement. It's just that engagement comes secondary to surrender to the king as his witnesses to the world. So sacrifice and that's not an easy one because it's the opposite of the spirit of the age. We don't sacrifice our wants and our desires. I just met with a young woman who's walked away from Door of Hope just recently. And, and when speaking to her about it, and I love her. And I, I want her, to, I'm like, the church needs you. And she's like, I, I just, I can't handle, you know, people telling me how to live. And man, I don't argue that Christians... I always say the greatest people I've ever met in my life are Christians and the worst people I've ever met in my life are Christians. And I would say that I've played the role of both sides of that. I'm pretty sure I've been the worst person I've ever known. And sometimes I can be honorable. Uh, the, the question is, is are we surrendered to Jesus and do we understand that we're all messes and we all have, we can be obnoxious in our opinions. Are we gracious? You know what TV show every Christian should watch right now? and I actually can say this and not actually feel like I'm violating anything, uh, is the TV show on Apple TV, Ted Lasso. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's, it is the most beautiful story of a guy who is a football coach who's asked to go and coach uh, English football, soccer, uh, premier English league, but he doesn't know anything about soccer. And the woman that hires him to be the coach, the owner of the team, 
hires him knowing that he doesn't know anything and she's just wanting to get revenge upon her husband who's cheated on her by hiring a coach to run the team into the ground. But what she didn't know is that Ted Lasso, the reason he's a great coach is not because of his understanding of the game. The reason he's a great coach is because of his understanding of people and his belief in the best in everyone that he meets. No matter how mean they are to him, he continues to practice this discipline of total optimism when it comes to looking for the best in the worst people. And his kindness is actually what makes the show funny because it's so out of place. You know how passionate Europeans are about football? <laughs> and they, like, they call him horrible names on the street and he just smiles at them and is kind to them. And he slowly the whole show is about him winning over the team and the team winning because someone believes in them and cares for them and actually loves them. And I was like, if everybody just exercised a little more Ted Lasso as in the church, we would be going, getting a lot further. It's not that he's blind to people's brokenness. He just believes there's something more there that isn't yet tapped. And this isn't about a self-help therapy. I would argue that if you apply a Christian grid to that, you can truly get to the truth of what it, that show wants to be saying. Because the fact is, is that we need Jesus to bring that out. And it requires a surrender that we don't fully understand, but we need to begin to push into, which leads me to transformation. In Romans 12, 2, he says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I love this. The key begins with the surrendered life, the sacrifice of my life. Jesus isn't interested in this or that part of me. He doesn't want the good parts and not the bad parts or the bad parts. He wants all of you. That's the first step. But the, the outcome of that is then the disciplining of ourselves, of recognizing that the world is trying to conform us to its image. And we play right into its hands. You want to ask yourself where spiritual discipline is necessary? It's in the discipline of asking ourselves what it is that we give our minds to. It says don't be conformed to the world. You can't escape the world. We are not as Christians called to avoid the world. The church is not to be a place where we escape the pagan influence of that place out there. We're not looking for a utopia on earth. We recognize that life is a battleground. And we recognize that our responsibility is to engage in that battle without succumbing to the sway of the wicked one, which we are told that the whole world is under the sway of Satan. Do we not understand that? That is why people get so frustrated with me when I refuse to pick sides around, around politics right now. I'm like, I reject the right and the left and give my allegiance solely to King Jesus and his kingdom. Human kingdoms come and go. They rise and they fall. I'm grateful for where I live. I am called to submit myself to the authorities in as much as it allows me to continue to be a witness to the kingdom of Jesus. I care and desire to have live peaceably, if possible, amongst all people for the purpose of witness to King Jesus. I pay my taxes, I do the things that I should as a citizen and I'm grateful that I have the freedom to worship. But all of these things come under the umbrella of the Lordship of Christ. And we should be able to see what the world is for what it is and understand these things. And the, the goal is not to escape the world, but we do need to learn how to elude it and elude its systems that are infiltrating our hearts and minds. And let me just give you the simple question. If you want to know where your allegiance is, all you have to ask is the simple question of what do you spend the majority of your time thinking about? And, and the question that I would immediately ask is like, look at how much time you spend on social media. This is a great one. I mean. Netflix just released the social network. I still haven't watched it, but I've heard enough about it to know that it's, it's, making, it's troubling a lot of people. And are we actually surprised by the information that they've discovered about the dangers of social media? We, we shouldn't be. But ask yourself the question, how much time do you spend doing this? And how much time do you spend in the word, in prayer, in service, 
the things that you do that keep your mind fixated upon Jesus? And why do we feel so spiritually dead when we spend hours upon hours watching the news and taking in the propaganda that is coming to us in partial information? You know, if most people came to Portland, they are already assuming, if you want to know how, how uh, misinformation passes, is just talk to anyone that doesn't live in our city and they would believe that the entire city has essentially been burned down and that, that it looks like the ruins from the movie, The Planet of the Apes. And it's true, there is blocks downtown that have been decimated and 30% of the businesses in downtown Portland have actually left Portland. And it, it, there is no getting around that we are going to wreak an, an economic disaster when all is said and done. We're just buying time with COVID right now. We're gonna not feel the impacts of what's gonna happen to our economy locally until this is all said and finished. But the fact is, is that there is sections there, but not decimated the way that they would portray in the news. And it's because we can't get the full information. The information is put through a lens of particular agenda. This is why our minds need to be fixated upon something that is more solid. The transforming of the mind needs to be, we need to be captivated by Jesus, captivated by his word. And I have found in my own life that over COVID and these months that my attention span and ability to stay anchored in scripture has become more and more difficult. And this is why we're doing this series is because I think a lot of Christians are feeling that. It's not good for us to be isolated and that isolation leads to uh, leads to a, a, a diminishing return when it comes to spiritual disciplines because our disciplines are meant to be practiced in community. But the fact is, is that we are shaped by what it is that we are captivated by. And whatever captivated, captivates you, captures you. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. If we think differently, we will inevitably live differently. We need a different lens. We need to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, which is that you become so intimately engaged with him. And this is why, as we close, the third reality is not just surrender. It's not just sacrifice. It's not just transformation, but it leads to ultimately direction. You will be able to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The direction that comes to the renewing of the mind is this beautiful reality that he is always willing to guide us if we are willing to follow. Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse five. Now may the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. The question of biography, who am I, is discovered when we by faith live fully by him and for him. The will of God is simple. He wants you to know him the way he knows you. He wants you to give yourself to increasing degrees of intimacy in any relationship, whether it's divine or human, requires time and attentiveness and intentionality. And this is where the disciplines of faith begin. It's not a works-based salvation. I am saved. I, am, I have been purchased at a price. I have had the love of God poured out of my heart. But that love will grow cold if we do not invest in that relationship. We don't graduate beyond it. The will of God is just going wherever God has you go. And what Jesus is interested in is not making you happy. He's interested in making you holy. And your holiness is not your moral perfection. Your holiness is your connection to the one who is perfect. What he wants you to be is a witness to his love. He wants you to know that you are loved so that you can tell others that they are loved. Even as I've been working on this house project for three months, it's so cool. I've been sharing the gospel. I've had all these workers come and work at the house that aren't Christians. And to just today, I had this young guy who came to church today for the first time in his life. And he is so hungry to know who Jesus is. He's lived his whole life here. And he is the sweetest 
kid. And he came in after service. He's like, I really enjoyed that. And I go, was it what you expected? He goes, it was mellower. I'm like, it's kind of extra mellow right now. Um, uh, but but it just, it's just people want to know that they're loved. They desperately want to know that. And the will of God, I feel the pleasure of God's will being played out in my life when I point people to Jesus. I don't feel that pleasure when I get into a combative, argumentative mode where I believe the worst about the people around me, when I get mad and angered. And what God is trying to help me see is like, even when I see people doing things that make me crazy inside, he's, he's like, I love them. I created them for myself. Do not ruin that witness. Begin with your family, your friends, but then it needs to move out. The homeless camps throughout our city, the tensions in, in that continue in downtown. Do we pray for, think about this in the politics right now. Do you hate the politicians running? The, our current president or the person running for president? Or do you, do you feel, do you pray for people? Do you want to believe that God actually loves those people that run our country? Because he does. And we have no right to side with the ways of the world in a place of continual hostility, we must be conduits of the very grace we say has saved us. And nothing requires discipline like that. You guys, Jesus loves you. These are hard days, but so what? Jesus said it was gonna be hard. And the best is yet to come. This is an apocalyptic age that requires extreme discipline. A discipline of the heart to fully embrace the grace of Jesus. May we sacrifice ourselves for him and his glory alone. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gospel and its ability to bring transformation to our lives. We pray in this time and in this age that we would not lose sight of the call to be the witnesses that you have created us to be. Forgive us for allowing the voices of this age to so infiltrate our ways of thinking that we have lost you in the midst of it. Forgive us for the ways that we define for ourselves right and wrong, for the ways that we pick and choose what we want to believe, rather than just simply surrendering our whole life to you and recognizing that a surrendered life to you is only going to bring the hostility of the world and we shouldn't be surprised by that. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would purify your church in these days and that we would be greater and greater conduits of your love. I pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys want to stand with me? Thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, not be all else to me, say that Thou art, Thou my best thought, by day or by night, waking or sleeping, Thy presence my life.
high King of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven's joys, oh bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Heart of my own heart, whatever before, still be my vision, O oh, ruler. Before we sing this last song, everybody, I just want to remind you that we'll have prayer available up front after after this song. If you want prayer, that will be open to you. Um, and I, we ask that you exit out of the, the door on this side rather than the one you came in on. Um, and lastly, we could use help. Um, we need some volunteers to help clean, wipe down the seats and clean up to prepare for the next service. So if you're willing to do that, we could really use some help. You can see Chelsea in the back after service, and she can give you the supplies. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. It's good to see you guys, and let's sing together this last song. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life, but I've heard a tender whisper of love. You're pleased that I am never alone Your good, good father It's who you are It's who you are It's who you are And I'm loved by you It's who I am It's who I am It's who I am
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time and this space to worship you, Lord. Go with us. Uh, let us realize your blessings uh, for our life this week, Lord. And we just love you and thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great Sunday, everybody.